Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Dave Goodman in Sydney, Australia. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bart. Nice to be here. Yeah, this has been a long time in the works. Um, I should say you're a drummer, educator, and clinician, and you have a musicology PhD, and your thesis was on the great Tony Williams, which is uh, who we're here to talk about today. Tony Williams is one of those people where, um, as I was saying to you before we kind of started, that like many drummers, um, he's obviously a legend, but there's just something very special about him. Um, he's mm. he's an icon. I mean, he's if, if there was like a, a Mount Rushmore, which obviously is a very American <laughs> reference with the presidents all carved into it, he would be up there. Um, on that note, why don't we jump in for the sake of time, because we've got a lot of stuff to cover, um, and yeah. why don't you go ahead and take us back to the beginning of Tony's life? Great. Well, yes, let's start at the very beginning. Tony, Tony Williams was born in Chicago, Illinois, on the 12th of December, 1945. And when he was two, his family moved to Boston. And that's where he grew up and had all of his early musical experiences. Um, his father's name was Tillman. And he was African-American and his mother's name was Alice Juanez. Now, she was 14 when Tony was born. So um, she she had apparently a lot of growing up to do very quickly at that time. Now, she was of Portuguese Chinese descent. So I, I remember hearing Tony say in an interview once very proudly that he's of African-American Euro-Asian descent. Wow. It's a very worldly guy mm. there. Um, the, Man, that's the, young. 14. Yeah. How about that? That's interesting because Tony has a certain kind of uh, like facial, like a structure. Like I didn't know actually his his heritage, which obviously that that probably spoke to a lot a lot to his um, uh, musical influences too. I would imagine, which we'll probably hear about later. Oh yeah, I mean the music started very early in his uh, in the household there in Boston. You know, we're sort of talking post war times, and uh, his father was a saxophone player played club gigs on the weekend, um, and that was really what would happen. There were two sort of lines would happen. He would take young Tony out to all those club gigs on the weekends. Mm. And um, But in the household, they had a lot of records, you know, so, you know, dad's listening to Billy Eckstein, Nat King Cole, Louis Jordan, Sonny Stitt, Gene Ammons, and the list goes on. And mum was listening to Tchaikovsky and Wagner. Um, you know, and it's interesting to note that, like, also around that time, you know, LPs started to be produced in 1948. Um, live recordings were first made in 1945. You know, it took them a while to sort of take hold. Um, gosh, you know, uh, I guess uh, jazz record sales doubled in 1957. So mm. there was, but it was still like a lot less than what Elvis Presley and pop artists were producing at that time you know so um there was a lot of music a lot of listening and um he said that he was just drawn to the drums when he was a child um and um he decided he wasn't going to be a saxophone player even after his father gave him the opportunity to play saxophone and he'd just sit in the audience at those gigs and you know he he thought you know he's looking at the drummers thinking if he can do that you know i know i can do that and he said that's just something that you know which is kind of cool. He yeah. had this natural aptitude for it. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's just mm. like, uh, I'm sure you feel that way. And, and I feel that way where you're as just as a kid, you're drawn to the drums. Mm. When did he get a drum set? You know, when did that all start? Well, that, that happened just a little bit later. Um, he, I believe he was already playing by the time he got a set of drums. So it was uh, 1956 hmm. that his dad bought him a Radio King drum set. And that had like a 28 inch or 30 inch bass drum, 16 inch floor tom, a snare and some 12 or 13 inch hi-hats that had really large bells, like a nine inch bell. And, uh, you know, I've, I think I've seen a photo of young Tony at those drums. It'd be really interesting for you or one of your listeners to uh, see if they can find those drums where they yeah. are these days. They must be in some museum somewhere, surely. Oh, my God. That sounds very um, almost like trap set ish that with those huge mm. bass drums and everything mm. um but you said he was starting to play the drums a little bit before he actually had a drum set yeah that's right so uh, in about 1954 so a couple of years before this um he was eight and uh, his father took him to a gig one night and gave him the opportunity to sit in 
And he asked him, well, what would you like to play? And he said, well, I'd like to play the drums. And so without having received any formal tuition, he played that night. Mm. And uh, apparently it was very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's surprising. I mean, I feel like nine times out of 10, you'd have someone just sit down and it would be a train wreck. I mean, we've always heard mm. the like, oh, I want to play the drums. And it's that, that, you know, that like doesn't sound musical. So clearly he was born for this. Yeah. And there was, in some interviews, it, there's a little bit of conjecture about the exact timeline, but but somewhere around there, he did also attend like a rhythm and drum class. And apparently that's when he got his first set of sticks. So it, that's within the same year or so okay. from what I can gather. He played a little bit. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, so that that went on and on. He, he, he went around, like, so dad took him around to all the clubs as often as he could. So after a few years, Tony was well known enough by all the club managers and owners that that, that actually let him in without his parents there, even as a mm. as a young teenager. Um, and uh, he he also said somewhere that that he was making tips. People would give him money, and he he'd go home with thirty dollars one night, and the guys in the band were only working for fifteen or twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> he probably had like the cute factor as a little kid, you know. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Cool. Mm. All right, we'll keep chugging from there. Yeah, so around, around about this time, um, it's when he met one of his most important influences. And that, that's a man that we know now today as the great Alan Dawson. Uh, and it's interesting to note that from what I can gather, um, when he started teaching Tony, Tony was actually his first formal student. He wasn't really known as a teacher before this. Um, he was a drummer that, that Tony's dad played with on occasion. And uh, so uh, Tillman invited Alan Dawson around to the house one time when Tony was about nine. <laughs> Dawson can't decide whether Tony was nine or 10 or 11 when he met him, but somewhere around that time. Sure. And they went up into the attic. Tillman played the saxophone and Tony started playing along. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, Dawson said words along the lines of like, you know, this, this kid was, this kid started to cook. <laughs> he had beautiful <laughs> time, it. beautiful fills, uh, great taste and a good feeling, everything but chops. Um, huh. yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. How about that? Um, so there was a natural flair for it, obviously. Um, but he could, could have afforded to have learned a lot more. So Dawson actually took him under his wing and taught him how to read. He didn't know how to read at that point hmm. and taught him the rudiments cause he didn't know the rudiments at that point. Apparently Max Roach, he, <laughs> another thing is that he'd already Max Ro- met Max Roach by this time. And wow. so Max kind of kicked his butt a little bit to, to get with Dawson apparently yeah. as well to get these rudiments under his belt. Um, I'm assuming it'll be out by the time I do this, but I just did an episode with John Ramsey who studied with Alan Dawson mm. and he was the chair at uh, the drum department chair at Berkeley for years. But it was, we talked about how there's this Boston kind of like, uh, you know, Max Roach and um, mm. Alan Dawson. It's just, there's something about this, these Boston guys. Um, so, and, and Max Roach came up in that episode as well. So Right place, the right time, you know? Yeah. I, I think these guys were just passing through town so much. And, and, and again, Tony's dad was just so adamant about taking him out to all these gigs. So um, when he started with Dawson, you know, like, I mean, Tony said that not only did he teach him how to play the drums, but he taught him how to conduct himself as a musician mm-hmm. and as a man, you know, yeah. which is really nice. And, and the other thing that's really interesting about Dawson is that, um, and, and actually I've had some long conversations with the great pianist Hal Galper about this. Um, Hal wrote to me a few years after my thesis was published and he, he wanted to um, touch base and he, he was a fan of the work. And um, mm-hmm. so we've, we've stayed in touch since then. And he was actually a really big part of Tony's youth um, in Boston as well, playing in bands with Sam Rivers and stuff. And, and Hal used to play with Dawson and he said that he was one of the most clear drummers you could imagine hearing. And, and when he hears Tony play, even at the age of 12, he can oh. hear that same clarity, that, that, you know, clarity of ideas. Hmm. Um, yeah, that was a big, yeah. a big part of it. From what I understood about hearing about Alan Dawson was it wasn't like he wasn't a mean drill instructor types type teacher, mm. but he he knew what he wanted. And and a, a lot of uh, what John Ramsey was saying about him was was the use of like stick control and syncopation, but the incredibly innovative ways that he would use these books to have them, yeah. you know, grow their independence. And I think it was like working through the first few pages, but you'd be playing and then you'd be simultaneously um, humming a melody to a song while you're running through, you know, stick control to get a, a certain kind of musicality uh, to your plane, which 
anyone out there who's heard Tony Williams knows he's a very musical drummer. Yeah, that's right. And and I guess we just don't know if he was teaching that method at that time. Sure. You know, and, and I wouldn't have the first clue about w- where those ideas came to Dawson, if they were his original ideas or if, oh, yeah. you know, if that was a musical thing. But yeah, it is interesting to note that he, he certainly became one of the great, great, great teachers for all of that. Um, cool. So yeah, keep going there. So, so right now Tony's yeah. 12, he's jamming with his dad. They're up in the attic. They're, they're having fun. He's cooking, uh, but not oh, yeah. chopping. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. uh, well, around this time, that's when he said that he started listening to Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey and Max Roach. And he labeled them the big three. Mm. And uh, he, he had this idea that to make the perfect drummer, you, you needed feel, technique and creativity. And he was able to see these traits embodied in the work of these three guys. He thought that Art Blakey really embodied feel, Max Roach embodied technique and Philly Joe Jones embodied creativity. Um, and that, that was really interesting to me um, in the study. So I said, when I did my musical analysis, I sort of looked at all of them through the lens of those ideas. And, and it was try- interesting to try and hear that in his playing as compared to their playing too. Um, and mm-hmm. so um, he was listening to them on recordings, trying to incorporate all their ideas, listening to uh, Jazz Messengers, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, all the prestige, Blue Note and Riverside releases, you know, and... and uh, uh, also, um, around that time, that's when he started seeing them play live. Um, so, uh, in 1958, Art uh, Blakey played in Boston. So, Tony's what he's around about uh, 12 or 13 this time. Hmm. And Blakey's there with the Jazz Messengers. And Tony had developed enough confidence and skill by this time to ask Blakey if he could sit in with the Jazz Messengers. <laughs> And like you said, sure. <laughs> wow. You got to walk the walk the walk if you're going to go up there and ask. You know what I mean? He's probably like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Kid. You want to back it up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Back it up. And the band on that occasion is incredible. It was Lee Morgan on trumpet. Wayne Shorter was playing saxophone, who, of course, he ended up playing with in Miles Davis' band later yeah. on anyway. And Bobby Timmons on piano. So what an impressive band. He really thought like, you know, Art Blake, he, he just, his, the sound of his ride cymbal and hi-hats really, really strong really stuck out to him as something to latch on to. And I think that's like, you know, and I tried playing along with some Art Blakey recordings when I was studying and just like to get that kind of sound and that great big sound out of the cymbal. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. That seems to have a, a character of feel about it to me. Yeah. But his, well, like you, I mean, you're obviously a, a, a studied man, but like with, with what he's done too as a kid, I mean, clearly the, the amount of hours he's put in on this is, um, is, yeah. is really showing off. So, so that must've been kind of a, not, not really, I guess it wouldn't be a big break, but that had to be a big moment for him. Oh, no doubt. You know, and I, I, from what I can gather, he, he really started to increase his, um, dedication, I guess, from around the age of 12 or 13. He said at some point he started practicing eight hours a day. He left school at some point to, to play the drums. He started doing a lot of local gigs himself. So yeah, I can just imagine those interactions with, with someone as revered as Blakey. You know, and then like a year later, Max Roach is in town and he asked Max if he could sit in as well. And Max let him, you know, and, mm. and that was a great band. Art Davis on bass, George Coleman on saxophone, another Miles Davis alumni that he ended up playing with. Mm. Uh, it's, it's just phenomenal, you know. And um, what's really interesting about um, his interaction with Max Roach is that, um, well, I, you know, he, I mean, he loved, apparently Art Blakey was his first love, but Max Roach became his sort of greatest love and he had already done enough gigs by this time. He was saving 20 to out of $30 a week from the gigs he was doing on the weekends. Um, and he bought the same silver sparkle Gretsch Max Roach set uh, oh, at around cool. that time. Yeah. So I think that's the set of drums he used uh, in his early days in New York. Wow. And that kind of, uh, I mean, he obviously had a long relationship with Gretsch. So I guess that might've been his, uh, cause you said he was radio King first so we started out Slingerland yeah. and then uh mm-hmm. it, I, I always say it in here but it just goes to show that how influential and important seeing your 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 idols what they play oh, how yeah. that makes you want to play those drums yeah that's right and just trying to match that sound and and the the bit that really struck out as interesting to me and I'm sure uh, um, a lot of people would be interesting 
interested in finding this out, is that, uh, again, around that time in his early teenage years, his parents had divorced by that point, and he was living at home with mum. And she was so young, right? So so she apparently was leaving town uh, on a Monday morning and returning on a Friday evening to go and further her education. I don't know what she was studying. Hmm. But what, what this precocious young man would do would, Tony would get on a bus and go to New York um, and wow. stay in New York for a week uh, and then return on Friday morning before mum got home. And she'd be like, what have you been doing? Oh, I've just been hanging out. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he must have really struck up some some deep friendships with these elder players, obviously, you know. Um, and I think that Max Roach, knowing Alan Dawson already, they that was a warm introduction all around. And yeah. the bit that's probably of real interest here is that um, it's that K Zildjian sound that, that he's known for, you know. So um, yeah. I've got a little quote here from him on that, um, on the symbol of the 1960s that he's so mm-hmm. famous for. So here, and I quote, the K sound. I got that from Max, actually. Years ago, I think it was 1960, I came to New York to visit Max. I'd met him, I think, in 59 or 58. I went to visit him and we went out to the old Gretsch factory in Brooklyn. I met Mr. Gretsch, Fred Gretsch. At this time, they had K Zildjian's at the factory. Max said, hey, why don't you take this one? This sounds great. So Max started me on the sound, a big, high, dark sound. That's the ride symbol I have. It's a high tone, but the symbol itself is a dark sound. I learned that definitely, among other things, from Max. So there you go. Max wow. Roach actually gave him that symbol directly from the Zildjian warehouse. Man, I mean, there's so much um, history in that alone. Where and mm. and I I almost I kind of found it confusing. Where not what you said. I found it confusing doing a Zildjian <laughs> episode where there was a whole thing where Gretsch owned the rights to certain Zildjian, mm. um, like they owned. K Zildjian or and someone else mm. owned A. Yeah. I think I have that backwards, but where Fred Gretsch owned them and there was there's lawsuits and copyright issues. Um and yeah. they can own the Turkish made things and <laughs> um so Gretsch is involved. So just there's a lot of history right there in that that little bit. Yeah. I remember hearing Mel Lewis talk about some issues there uh, at that time. He had yeah. trouble getting getting the symbols he wanted. It's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would direct people to the Zildjian episode. Uh, with Paul Francis, because we talk about it, but my my mind is failing me at this point. But um, okay, because he's <laughs> he's very famous. I mean, that K sound is uh, is pretty legendary. So that's very cool to hear that. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing about that too is I've, I've talked to people who have offered me the information of saying, like, you know, a friend of mine went to um, a you know a, a workshop that uh, I, I think it was Wallace Roney put on uh, Tony's trumpet player from the eighties and nineties. Um, and and uh, he put a symbol up on the drum set, and he got all the drummers there to play it. Now, I don't know if this is the very symbol that we're talking about, but you know, he said, "What do you think of that symbol?" And everyone went, "Oh yeah, whatever. It's just a symbol." And he said, "Well, guess what? That was Tony Williams' symbol. He gave that to me." <laughs> so, They're like, "Oh, I, think, I like it." <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know, with the artifact kind of thing, it's like, well, a lot of what we're talking about here is really, and I guess this is the main point that that I got from all this study is that like it really is about the individual. It's not so much the artifact thing is interesting, but but the actual playing of it is where the magic is. I would agree completely. I think that's so true yeah. across the board with symbols, with mm. drums, with uh, you know, un you know, dampened bass drums and certain things you might sit down and yeah. not like it, but if the right guy plays it or girl plays it, then it's uh that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, a testament to that uh, exactly story here for sure. So he stuck with the K's then for a long time, obviously did, uh, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that was basically, sure. he used those K's for a long time, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I'm not so clued up on the details through the seventies and so on, like when the K's became difficult to get, but I yeah. think that, um, I, I remember, um, reading that like in the nineties or so when all the A customs came out, you know, his drum tech at the time, um, Garrison, who works at DW now, um, got him a whole set of A customs to play and, and Tony really hated the fact that that happened, but he actually acquiesced and played his whole wilderness album with those A customs. And, mm. and it sounds beautiful. Sounds like him. He was like, okay, yeah, I need something new. So yeah. again, you listen to that album, you wouldn't know if they were K's or, or anything else. Yeah. It's just, it's Tony Williams. And that's the thing you hear his voice coming through the instrument. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Man, it mm-hmm. really is. It's him. All right, so moving on here, I'm looking at your timeline. So this is when, so you have teenage years when he really started ramping up. And this is, I mean, you kind of take for granted how young Tony was in that. There's like a very famous Miles Davis video where he's sitting there playing and it's black and white. And I'm sure, yeah. obviously, you know all about that. Um, yeah, take us through this. When did start to, th- when when did things start to pick up? Yeah, so I guess the, the real big deal um, was that um, Jackie McLean came to Boston in uh, December of 62 and Tony had been playing in the house band and Jackie McLean was the guest for the week. And one thing led to another. And to cut a long story short, basically Tony said to Jackie, I want to get out of here. I want to move to New York. And Jackie McLean said, well, why don't you come and work on the play that I'm musical director for in, in the city? And, you know, with your parents' blessing, your mum's blessing, we can do that. And so that's what happened on Christmas Eve, uh, 1962, Tony Williams moved to New York. Um, I guess he had just turned 17. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> I want to point out too, cause you said before he would sneak off to, to New York in the, mm. um, in, uh, you know, on his week where his mom was going to school. Cause for people, yeah. I mean, even you're in Australia, but for people around the world who might not know, and you might be thinking kind of geographically, mm. how far would that be? If I Googled New York to Boston distance, um, it says it's about 215 miles. So three hours and 37 minutes for, as a drive today in 2021. Mm. So I don't know, you mm. know, with like, if things were a little slower then, but so let's say it's about four hour drive just to kind of mm. put it into perspective. So everyone knows that, that, that it's not going from New York to California, <laughs> which is the complete opposite side of the country. Yeah. And I guess that's why all these guys were in Boston so much Yeah, you know, during his youth. So which you know, good for him. Yeah. All right. So Tony's in New York. Yeah. So now he's in New York and he's playing on this play with Jackie McLean. And I guess he's, you know, he's been let loose in the city. So he's uh, <laughs> um, basically uh, Jackie McLean apparently recommended to Miles Davis, who was looking for a new rhythm section at the time, why don't you come and check Tony out? In fact, sorry, he had already met Miles. <laughs> um, one of the other occasions about sitting in on, in Boston was he you know, Jimmy Cobb was playing drums and he asked Jimmy, can I sit in? And he said, well, you have to ask Miles. So he asked Miles and he says, go back, sit down and listen. (laughs) So (laughs) Miles didn't let him sit in. (laughs) Wow. He's asked everyone to sit in. They've all said yes. But Miles was like, Mm. no. Yeah. How about that? So, (laughs) (laughs) so I think eventually, you know, he got to New York and somehow Miles found out about him. This is that kid from Boston. And, uh, you know, apparently Lewis Hayes also recommended Tony because Tony, uh, Miles asked him if he could join it, but he was with Cannonball Adderley. So, um, well, this three day session happened. Miles invited Tony to his apartment on, I think it's 77th street, if I remember correctly. And Herbie Hancock was on piano and Ron Carter was on the bass. And um, now Tony didn't know this at the time, but uh, apparently, you know, he says I, he didn't find about, out about this until many years later. But and I quote, Miles had me. Um, oh, sorry. Herbie Hancock said this. Miles had me, Tony and Ron play together in the recreation room downstairs in his 77th Street Manhattan apartment. So he was upstairs listening to us over the intercom. <laughs> Uh, he came in when we got there, when we first got there, and played a few notes on his horn and said, oh, shit, I'll be right back. Uh, and that's the last we saw of him. You know, so <laughs> apparently Ron Carter led the audition and he just, there were a few charts on the piano and he took them through those things. And Miles is upstairs. Now, apparently it, this went for three days. And um, at various points over those three days, he had his friends, you know, closest friends, the arranger and composer extraordinaire, Gil Evans, and also Philly Joe Jones um, invited them to come and listen, you know, mm. and and obviously he was very happy with the sound. And I think on the last day he went downstairs and he, he played a few tunes with them. Man. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, it's, I don't want to say it's bizarre. It's awesome. But it's like this just weird situation where it's like, if I were Tony and those guys and, and Herbie Hancock, I'd be like, all right, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh, that's right. I th- they must have had a sense of what was going of on. Room Miles Davis' house and just playing. Like, he must be hearing us. Yeah, he's got to be hearing been, you. Wow, that's would neat. have been wild. <laughs> yeah, what an experience. But so he obviously uh, he passed the test. 
No doubt, yeah. And, and it was very shortly after that that they recorded the um, tracks that appeared on the album Seven Steps to Heaven. So that was, I think it was April, April 63, I think they, they did that. Mm. Um, but it's interesting to note too that like there's an interesting little period. So, you know, Christmas Eve 1962 before April 63 when he joins Miles, he'd already made four albums for Blue Note at that time. Two, mm. two sessions with Jackie McLean. One's called Vertigo, but it wasn't released at the time. Uh, it was recorded, like released way later, like the late 70s or 80s. Uh, and then another album called One Step Beyond, which did come out at the time. And um, there's an album called My Point of View by Herbie Hancock. And um, one other album, I can't think of it right now. I think Kenny Dorham's album, yeah, uh, sure. Bruno Mars. Wow. And... Yeah, and you listen to those. I mean, the, listening to Vertigo is is an experience. Uh, you you think you're hearing a young Tony when on those early Miles things, but actually he's he's got it together on this his very first recording session in February '63. Yeah, I think it's important you said that because, like, I don't know. I think sometimes historically you, you see it as like this, like um, this magic where, to, where 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 Tony says, "Can I sit in?" and and then they say, "Yeah," and then okay, now he's famous. Where no, he's put in mm. a lot of work. Oh he's, yeah, he's studied. Yeah. He's yeah. played in a rec room for three days. No, I'm kidding. But yeah. like, <laughs> he's done all kinds of things. But yeah. but where he's been, he's this isn't his first session. You know what I mean? He's been oh, on yeah. albums. So that's not to say that he's just some phenom who came out of the nowhere and then was with Miles Davis. Because sometimes pop culture makes you think that mm. that everything so for some people it just happens overnight. But uh, he worked. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally musically adept. You know, one, one interesting thing, too, that Hal Galper told me that I haven't seen in print anywhere is that when, um, when Tony started playing with Sam Rivers back in Boston, around the time he was 15 or 16, and, and Hal was playing piano, uh, I think it was Richard Davis on bass, what they would do is they would get together and play a tune for an hour, and then they'd, they'd take a break, and then they'd come back in and play that same tune again, but they'd actually work an arrangement in on top of the tune right mm. so i don't know what kind of arrangement it was they'd play that for an hour and then they'd take another break come back in put another arrangement on top of the arrangement that they put there before that previous break wow and then they go and take another break and then finally at the end of the day they'd come back play the tune again with no arrangement and just see what came up and that according to how you know really influenced the way the band would interact and and i can hear in some of the miles recordings you know the interaction that he had with herbie on um, the live in tokyo session they're playing this they're actually superimposing this long seven four over the very fast four four you know and it's like it takes them like two hits to know like i think herbie plays it and then tony's like oh i know what you're doing you know and and joins and they play this long drawn out thing uh, not to get too analytical here but oh sure but that's, you know, I always thought, how in, on earth did they do that? And once I heard that from Hal, that they probably rehearsed putting these arrangements in, in that similar kind of way, you know, and, and, and then when they get up to play, there's no particular arrangement, but because they've done that work, um, that informs the kind of interaction. I, I love that idea. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, mm. God, they've, they're just, it's, it's like, uh, there's no surprise. Nothing can, it almost seems like nothing can surprise them. Like you can, they can throw whatever they want at each other and they've already been yeah. through all this stuff and there's, you know, different time signatures and laying arrangements on top of each other. So that's right. Just a mastery. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's, and there's an idea in like musical theater um, that, that I was intrigued by when I was doing this study. And I, I, I realized that like Ron Carter absolutely embodied this, whether he was directly aware of it or not, but it's like this idea in musical theater of like, yes. And you have to just say something ridiculous and yeah. your counterpart has to, acknowledge that and go on with something it's not no but it's yeah. yes and and i think they really really embrace that spirit of that you know yeah it's very jazzy um, <laughs> yeah so uh all right so how old well first off and i remember someone mm. talking to me about this um mm -hmm. tony williams for the very in the early years was typically referred to as anthony williams is that correct mm -hmm. yeah okay so anthony at this point really um yeah how old was he when he joined up you know, basically getting involved with Miles. Uh, well, I guess, uh, what are we talking about? April 63. So he's still 17. 17. Okay. That's what I thought. It's kind of the famous, he was 17 when he was there. So, mm. so, okay. Got it. Then you can hear, of course, from this very brief story that there's 10 solid years of 
interaction with some of the best and and just some incredible performance practice going on prior yeah. to that. So he certainly didn't come out of nowhere. No, exactly. Um, like that's we for said. sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. So where do we go from there? Well, I guess uh, you know he's he's um, he's in the Miles Davis fold now. Um, he's he's developing some notoriety, you know, and and there there are factions. Some people like it. Other people really don't like it. Um, you know, he was really into playing fast at that time, which alienated a bunch of people in Boston, apparently. Um, but, you know, and apparently the traveling got to him a little bit, you know, they got to Europe for the first time and he wanted to go home, I guess, cause he's just still so young and he's a kid. He's really only been interested in the drums. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he can play the hell out of the drums, but you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, he said that throughout that time he was, he actually felt, um, quite lonely. He had to go through it all alone and, and it was quite emotional as well, which is interesting. He said, you know, at various points, like, you know, people wanted Tony Williams, the drummer, but no one was interested in Tony Williams, the person. So it's interesting to note that all this is going on. And yeah. uh, he said his teen years lasted well into his twenties. <laughs> um, yeah. In, you know, I bet, you know, what's cool though, yeah. is it's interesting to think too about it, having a mom who is so young when she has you, like I just quickly used the calculator and kind of did it. Like when he's 17, mm. his mom is 31. So she's yeah, so wow. young too. They must've been yeah. really close. I would imagine like, yeah. Right. I think so. Um, when, when dad moved out, there was another, um, tuba player, Howard Johnson moved into the house. Um, and he lived there for about two or three years. And, and, um, he was on the scene mm -hmm. he, he and Tony actually left Boston at the same time. Because it wasn't it, Howard Johnson thought it wouldn't be appropriate for him to be renting the room in the back of his mum's house. People would think they were together and all this stuff. So yeah, you know, respectfully, he, he left <laughs> <laughs> uh, when they very obviously weren't. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I think they were close, and and he really did respect her guidance on on what what he was allowed and not allowed to do, despite the fact that he snuck away on the bus. <laughs> Yeah, York. which he's not. Yeah, what what Mama doesn't know doesn't hurt her. I guess is the. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I guess so. <laughs> the same. Okay, so he's but he's he's a uh, he sounds a little bit. I don't want to say sensitive with the the going mm. to Europe and the missing home and people not knowing mm. who he is. But he sound he seems very uh, emotionally intelligent. Uh, mm. You know, like like not just a, a drummer who hits stuff. Who's in the back? He's he's an artist. Oh, definitely, and and it's really interesting. You know in moving on, like when you mentioned that his name was Anthony Williams, that's, that's correct. He released two albums on blue note. One was recorded when he was 18, uh, called lifetime. And that was blue notes first. And perhaps one of their only avant-garde releases. It's really quite out uh, when you listen to mm -hmm. it. Um, that one and, um, gosh, I can't think of the name of the other album right now, but, but they were both really quite avant-garde and, and he was really clear. I, this is one of the things that really strikes me about him too, is that, um, he goes to great length in, in, you know, various interviews to say that he really wasn't interested in sounding like anybody else, but the only way that he could come up with his own original sound was to have gone through the process of learning to play exactly like all these guys. Hmm. And he claims to have done that prior to all of this. And so what he ended up playing was what they didn't play. Hmm. And when I was studying, I didn't have any recorded evidence that this is the case. I just had his words, but um, there's, there's a, there's a clinic on YouTube now that's, that's come out. Um, so I think it's 1987. He's in Germany somewhere. It's a three hour long presentation. And right at the end, he's got his great big bus driver drums. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. A, you know, characteristic of that period. Sure. And, and towards the end of that presentation, it, it, it comes about that he actually goes and does all these impersonations of these guys we've already mentioned, Max Roach, Art Blakey, Philly Joe Jones, uh, include also like, I remember Roy Haynes and maybe one or two others. And when you listen to him, like we were talking about before, like it's not the artifact, it's the way you play it. He made his drums, those same drums sound yeah. He didn't sound like Tony Williams playing it. He sounded like Max Roach playing those drums. He sounded like Roy Haynes. Play. He sounded like, oh, Elvin was the other one, Elvin yeah. Jones. Wow. Hearing Tony Williams do an Elvin Jones impersonation is wild. And it's like, wow, yeah. he can play just like all of those guys, you know, even through to the 80s. But when you hear him play, he's very decidedly playing himself. And it's mm. informed entirely by that. I, that just knocks me out. Yeah, he's, oh my God, that's such a good point. It's, uh, mm. Which, 
all those guys are very unique, but Elvin especially is very his mm. own mm. sound. And Max Roach, all those guys are very, very unique where it's not, you know, I guess you'd say top of the pops kind of like just, you know, rock drummers. <laughs> these are these are these aren't easy things to imitate either. <laughs> you know? No, that's that's right. That's right. And there was one um one story from Howard Johnson about when he was living with Tony was that, you know, when uh, Coltrane's Africa Brass session came out, uh, album came out and I think it was 61 or 62. He said that like he, he heard Elvin play on that. And he, it, it just, he didn't like it at, at first apparently, but, but he warmed to it. And then he realized, and he's asking Howard Johnson, listen to those Tom Toms. Who's playing the Toms? Uh, you know? And, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. he played along with that over and over and over and over from the morning to night, he just played over and over with the Africa Brass session. And I think that's what he did with all of the records. He'd just play along um, um, as much as he could to really tr- cop that sound. Yeah. At this point right now, mm. is Tony, um, I don't want to say, or Anthony, I guess should, I should say, is, is he <laughs> not really a household name? Because I feel like for that usually mm. means like Buddy Rich or something where your grandma knows about him. You know what I mean? But yeah, is he yeah. amongst drummers? like a respected name i mean is his name like it does max roach art blakey elvin jones roy haynes do all these guys know about him as the young kid who's oh yeah 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 they do and 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 like including lewis hayes um like that they, they they all rate him very highly and mm-hmm. and and lewis hayes just said like you know he was absolutely dedicated you know and they used to practice together he said when they were in california touring together with miles and cannonball everyone else would be in the at the beach Lewis Hayes and Tony would be back in the hotel room practicing together. You know, and this is this is after he's joined Miles, of course. So he, he just didn't stop. And I read one account that said by about August 1965, it's, it's no doubt that he's been received internationally as being a new thing. Hmm. Um, and yeah, by the time, say, Eric Dolphy's record came out, Out to Lunch, you, you know that famous Miles Davis 1964 concert recorded at the Lincoln Center? Um, Yep. Yeah, what's it called? The two albums, My Funny Valentine and Four and More. Now it's mm-hmm. the complete 1964 concert. Well, that was February 64. So he's already been with Miles for about a year. Um, and uh, like two weeks after that, he goes into the Rudy Van Gelder studio in New Jersey and records Out to Lunch with Eric Dolphy. You know, th- that the juxtaposition of this really far out avant-garde thing with the standards that Miles playing. Yeah. Two week, it's, it's like he, he didn't operate in just one scene. He's straddling all of these different aesthetics coming and going and, and playing all these all-star blue note dates with, with everybody. He's already played with Joe Henderson and, and, and Bobby Hutchison and, and all these amazing, wow. the, the biggest names. Yeah, really. Miles, I guess, was a little bit, and I'm, I'm really speaking, you know, not as an expert in any way about Miles Davis, but there was a documentary that I think we've talked about mm-hmm. on the show before about Miles that came out sort of recently that was really cool. But so he was obviously sort of, um, uh, he would get kind of heated at points, you know, over certain things. Was did he and Tony get along really well, Miles and Tony? As as far as I'm aware, uh, Miles um, gave Tony free reign. Um, mm-hmm. He didn't he didn't tell him what to do. Uh, I've heard that a lot. But there's one little interview I read. I think maybe it's in Miles' autobiography where he said, you know, Tony didn't play the hi hat at some point, and and he said he got him to play the hi hat <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's what everybody did. So this this you know. Yeah. Yes, he told him what to play. No, he didn't tell him what to play. But I mean, they, I think Miles. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of lots of um, recollections of Miles um, the, of him saying like, you know, nobody knew um, what was going to happen, you know, and but they were excited by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this little this little guy on the drums just totally blowing them away. So the thing that I think musically, what one of the things that he really really changed. Um, that I noticed mostly when I was doing all my analysis was that, uh, and, and Miles Davis absolutely paved the way for this to happen, was like more of a sense of um, interaction in the band so that the drums aren't in the back line being a support act for the soloist at the front, you know, it's my big solo and you're going to support me. That that kind of hierarchy, he broke that down. and. Hmm. He he really complimented Miles' phrases. The end of the phrase, within an eighth note of Miles ending the phrase, Tony realized that, you know, here's a little spot. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that phrase here. Mm. And he does. And he does it over the bar line, because nobody was doing that either. Yeah. And he's all around the drums and and uh breaking up the time. That was that was pretty new the way the way he did that. And so I think Miles was it, it, that uh, 
it gave him a whole new sense of direction and motivation to to keep growing. I think he he said at some point like he'd stopped practicing and he before Tony joined the band he wasn't really, you know, he was just kind of just towing the line, I guess. Yeah. Um, but then when Miles, uh, Tony comes in and Herbie, of course, I mean it's not just Tony, but it's, of it's the whole yeah. band and Ron Carter legendary. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're all there together. And mm. it's exciting, and the whole world is hearing this for the first time. So if you're the if your name's on the marquee, I guess you're gonna be pretty excited by that, you know? Yeah. Mm. So, um, all right. Well, let's keep chugging forward. Obviously, sure. we then, as on your timeline, then Miles goes electric. So, yeah, take it on. Yeah, take it on from there. Yeah. So you know, you think of Coltrane dying in mid '67, and and that that's really when Tony started wanting to hear something else and you know electrically amplified guitars like Jimi hendrix was coming onto the scene um motown was big james brown came about so both tony and miles are starting to hear this electric guitar and and those kinds of grooves and they're obviously very popular um more popular you know, maybe jazz is dwindling a little bit yeah um so from you know i i noted a very definite period from the 4th of december 67 to yeah, eighteenth of February, nineteen sixty-nine. That's when, like, I, I call that like the electric period with Miles. So, um, one of the great recordings from that period of fear, the Kilimanjaro. Uh, that's that that really embodies this sound. Herbie Hancock's playing electric piano. Oh, also, uh, you know, keeping it um, current. Of course, the great Chick Corea has just left us. Um, yes, and gone to play the great uh, piano in the sky. <laughs> yeah, very uh, sad. Yeah, it's a devastating loss. Uh, well, I read somewhere that, that it was actually Tony Williams who um, recommended Chick Corea for Miles. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, in, in all the, uh, you know, the messages that are coming out about Chick uh, this, last, this last week or so, that, you know, Chick Corea getting with Miles was a very big pivotal moment in his career. And he'd already done some great stuff, but that was a deciding moment. So Tony Williams was responsible for that, apparently. Wow. Yeah, so he's on this album as well. Mm. It's just one of those guys where, uh, and there's other groups and bands where, like, there's like, like, there's like the uh, one person at the center, Miles, but then all these musicians that came off of it were just like, yeah, just like legends. Um, yeah, it's off the wall. It's amazing. Yeah. So you know, the, the the guitar is in there now. He's got George Benson playing the guitar. Um, Joe Beck was the first guitarist he used on mm. some of the, some of the stuff that came out on Circle in the Round. Um, uh, quite a few years after it was recorded. Um, and, um, gosh, yeah, the electric bass, you know, Miles was all about like, if I can hear the bass, I can play a bit better. So the, the whole electric sound was like a natural matriculation. It's like, wow, now we can hear everything. <laughs> and I think he's bashing out a bit more on the drums. Yeah. You know, he's starting to get a bit louder, um, because he's not, he's not limited, I guess, by the acoustic nature of, of the other instruments now. Not that, not that he sounds limited at all prior to that, but no, but by nature, you know, when things get louder, when you play with a band, then there's even when you're, you know, if you're playing a band, the speakers are better because you're playing in a bigger venue or something. It's like, oh, I can yeah. kind of play different. Mm. Yeah, What's your right. take? It's... I mean, you're you study this stuff. Do you like the mm. electric? Pe- do you have any feelings one way or the other about it? I mean, they're obviously different beasts. Oh, I, 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 I love it. I, I mean, I love them both for very different particular reasons. I, I, I can't really decide. I can't put one against the other. I, I do love the fact that it, it just evolved. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, it, it just seemed very natural, organic, um, a reaction to the pop culture of the time, the, the availability of the technology now to, to have portable amplifiers and stuff like that. Um, and, and just the way, you know, and, and with all the, you know, the civil rights movement having, having happened in 64 and, and everything that came about, you're just seeing the blending of, of black and white musicians now. And that's just like, Jazz rock really just embodies that to me, and I, I love it. I love it. There's no more segregation. You know, yeah, it's, it's really. everything's coming together. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Let's just play music together, and let's let's play a backbeat. Let's let's play an ostinato. Let's you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, like free all the time. So it's I'm, yeah. There's very very definite characteristics of all of that that I, I particularly love. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. These guys are tastemakers obviously so mm. it's it's got to be liberating and and i know there was something similar with uh obviously bob dylan going electric and people hated mm. it so mm. but i mean if you ask me again not being an expert on on either one what do you want stuff to just keep being the same like these guys have to these are yeah. these are innovative guys it just has to keep going yeah. forward 
Yeah, that's the main point, I think. And, and yeah, the, the, none of them were interested in rehashing any of their old stuff, you know. I think I think they'd had enough of wearing the tuxedos as well. You can see the def- definite change of wardrobe. Yeah, things got a little more far out. Came around. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that the and it it still sounds like the same people just playing something different now. You know, it's it's really cool. Um, yeah. So of course, at this time now, you've got Tony Williams. He's kind of a little bit sick of being under the thumb too. Like he's hearing these sounds and thinking, oh, I want to. You know, he'd been studying composition all of this time. So he wanted to break out and form his own band. And mm-hmm. there's a little bit of controversy about Miles Davis stealing John McLaughlin for the In a Silent Way session and, you know, wh- whatever about all of that. It, Tony Williams eventually broke away and formed the Tony Williams Lifetime with the great mm-hmm. Larry Young on the organ and John McLaughlin on guitar, who he brought over from England. Um, and that's, that's when really, you know, in a lot of history books, they say this is the beginning of fusion music, what it became known as fusion or jazz rock, whatever you want to call it. Um, and again, it's not like they're going, oh, let's make a new style. It just, it just grew organically out yeah. of all of the, everything that emerged. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And he's in his great. 20s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 22 or 23. And, and I remember him saying, actually, an interesting point since we mentioned Hendrix, I remember one interview which has since disappeared from YouTube. Um, so it's worth noting here that the guy actually identified Tony as being the only person who played with Jimi Hendrix, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. The Whoa. Hendrix thing was like a, a get together; it wasn't recorded, but yeah. um, but he had that distinction of being the only guy who played with all three. And the guy asked him, like, "What did they all have in common?" What a question, right? Yeah, really. And Tony's response was, "Well." What they all had in common was not only that they were prepared for the possibility of making a mistake, but they were actually willing to make mistakes. Hmm. How about that? So yeah. he, I think he was inspired by that in wanting to form Lifetime. He said, like, if I'm going to make any mistakes, I'm going to make them now. I don't want to wait till later on to make all the mistakes I'm going to make. I'm going to make them while I'm still young. So I don't know if he's talking about, like, you know, record contract stuff. I've heard all sorts of things about he was he was offered a Columbia deal as as an alumnus of Miles Davis band, but apparently that fell through, and that contract actually went to John McLaughlin. And uh, mm. Billy Hart knows about all of this. I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know. And then so and that's what that's how the Mahavishnu Orchestra started with McLaughlin using that contract. Oh, wow. And then Tony Tony got all disgruntled, and and you know, this whole thing about Billy Cobham. I mean, I'm I'm talking out of school here. I I you know Billy Cobham is is still with us and. I would like to talk to him personally about this rather than sure. making up conjecture, you know, but it is interesting. It's just an interesting period. Um, he's no longer, you know, Cobham is around now. So, and he's got the great big drum set. Tony's trying to find himself still. Um, and I think that the interesting point for me and everything I've looked at, I think the album, believe it, that came out, I think it was 76. You can hear it's like, he's, he's now, this is the Tony Williams that was always, in line mm. it was always going to be this um everything before this has led to this moment i really hear a very strong statement in the in the believe it album as far as his drum sound his playing his tunes his arrangements the band um mm. that's like a defining moment to me although i mean lifetime i mean the the emergency and everything he did with that band prior to it's like this real tumultuous period it's just like it's a lot of output, and um, and I just yeah. I feel like it all culminated in this um, when Alan Holdsworth joined the band, and yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, you mentioned bigger drums. I mean, that's all fascinating. You mentioned mm. bigger drums. So maybe rewinding quickly, because mm. obviously we can just spend all day talking about this. But, um, <laughs> so Tony traditionally was playing like a four piece kit or so, mm. right? Early in his yeah, earlier yeah. days, and then things yeah. progressively got bigger. So maybe just touch on his gear, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, when you listen to the Kilimanjaro album, you can actually hear a third tom tom. I don't know if it's a second floor tom or a second rack tom, but you definitely hear that third tonality. Um, and um, and later in the early seventies, you see footage of him playing a five piece Gretsch set, and there's a sort of smaller tom in between the regular rack and floor toms. And I think that's probably the third tonality that we're mm-hmm. hearing. Um, you know, on some recordings, actually, even before Roy Haynes um, came out with Now He Sings, Now He Sobs, famous flat ride sound, Tony's actually um, recording with a flat ride 
as an effect symbol like before Roy Haynes. Oh, <laughs> I wow. thought it was one interesting fact. Um, uh, although that wasn't released at the time, but um, it was, you know, it was there. He did it. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, and so there's this five piece set and then you hear the album, the old bums rush, I think it was 73 and you're hearing the larger drums, but it's, it's not quite as concise and coherent as again, what came out at 75, 76. Um, he's definitely using the bigger bass drum. There's no question about that. Like he went up to a 24 inch bass drum and apparently that was so he could hear himself over the volume of all the amplified drum, um, guitars and things now. Wow. So the, the music's that loud around them that he really needed that go from 18 to a 24. Um, and you talk to people who have heard that drum acoustically and, and it's just, it just hits you in your stomach, you know, it just goes straight through you. He had it very flappy and, and no muffling a lot of the time too, just poof, like a big concert bass drum. Man. Slamming the, you know. <laughs> yeah. He's got a big sound. Really I mean, you can tell that from... Mm watching YouTube videos on your computer speakers, you know, you yeah. can tell that he's got a huge sound, um, which yeah. thankfully we have all these videos. Yeah. So the big drums, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure my way of putting it together is it is a reaction to Billy Cobham um, in some way. Um, I don't know. That's just me making that up, um, but it would make sense if that came to be the case. Um, and so he's got, you know, 13 and 14 inch rack toms and a 14, 16 and 18 inch floor tom again on this 24 inch bass drum. And they're tuned melodically. It's tuned mm. to like a pentatonic scale. He's got only a tone between the three smaller drums and then a minor third up to the snare drum when the snares are off. And then like a, maybe a fourth and a fifth going down to the bigger drums. So he started playing around this time, these really melodic single stroke roll type, almost like the timpani, um, which, yeah. is, which is fascinating. Has he gone Beautiful. yellow at this point? I believe so. I think by the time he's actually playing with John McLaughlin and Larry Young, he's got a four-piece yellow Gretsch set. So I don't know what happened to the silver sparkle drums, but, but yeah. yeah, the yellow. And I think he stuck with okay. that. Because mm -hmm. he's like, those are, those are again, I keep saying the word, but those are very iconic. I mean, he's him playing a oh, yellow yeah. drum set is about as, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. they, they go together. That's right. Apparently not to, not to you know, I know we're going long here, but not to get too far ahead either, but it's like, you know, he went with DW later on. And I think apparently that was because Gretsch actually sent him like a yellow wrap instead of a yellow lacquer and he, he didn't like it and sent it back mm. and they sent it back again. And, you know, I, I don't know, that's, that's hearsay, but that's what sure. I've heard. Um, and so um, the yellow thing, you know, but he had the hardware painted red on that, on the DW drums, which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, <laughs> All right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, looking at your timeline, we're in about 77 ish now, mm, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point he moves to San Francisco. Um, I'm not sure what the reasons for that are. I think a lot of musicians actually moved from New York to San Francisco. Um, and, um, that's where he lived for the rest of his life. Hmm. Um, San Anselmo. And, um, apparently he made, he, he, um, he was making income from the brownstone apartment he owned in Harlem. So he was getting rental income for that. And that was, that's what paid for his life. Cause I think uh, obviously he's not playing as much. You're not just around town playing. So he did big tours with the VSOP band and all these all-star type lineups They they tour the world, but he was really interested in composition at this time. Like he's always been interested in composition, but I think from what I gather, he basically became a composer at that point. So he's doing a lot of counterpoint studies and orchestration studies and like learning to write like in the, in the same way he did it with the drums, learning to write in the style of Mahler, in the style of Schoenberg, you know, so that he can again find the cracks and end up emerging with his own sound, you know, mm. which, again, it's fascinating. So he, he got his, all the tools together that he could. So whenever one of those big tours or a record date came up and boy, oh boy, there's some fantastic ones over the next say 20 years or so until, until he died. Um, he would, he'd get on the drums a few days beforehand just to warm everything up again and, and just to get on board with everything, you know. So, so all that practice was done many, many years beforehand. Um, wow. And uh, I don't know too much about this period, but, um, but that's, you know, I guess if we forward to the 80s, he's now got his quintet, his sort of second stint with the Blue Note Records, and that he's been writing for that band. And really beautiful compositions, acoustic He's got the big drums, but he's in an acoustic quintet again now. Um, um, and people accused him of modeling it on Miles Davis, but again, he, he thought, well, no, this is, but this is my music. 
it's not, yeah. it's not, I'm not modeling on Miles Davis at all. So that's fascinating. That is fascinating. People always want to, I don't know, when you're a celebrity musician, even if you're a drummer, um, I say that, I think everyone knows what I mean. You're not like Britney <laughs> Spears or something up there. Like you're, <laughs> we're in the back, um, yeah. but we're still, we're still great. But, but even then, if you're a famous musician, they still want to kind of like poke at you a little bit. You know what I mean? And say, oh, you're just doing it like miles. Like yeah. it's such a long career at that point already. Yeah, that's right. And I guess those the people writing those articles or putting those news posts together, they want to sell copies. So some kind of controversy and something something to argue over is going to you know move some units. I guess. Very true. Um, that's that's um, pretty much every uh, entertainment you know <laughs> magazine out there. That's exactly what <laughs> that's it is. Right. They don't say everyone's great. We love everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, it doesn't truth sell. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was an interesting sound. And those, those albums are beautiful. He put some lovely little drum solo vignettes on there. And, um, you know, it, to me, it still sounds, you know, it still sounds very much like the same person just a little later in life, having gone through whatever he went through. And, um, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's San Francisco. And, you know, I mean, his discography really speaks most clearly, you know, like you, you listen to the recordings that he did throughout this period. I mean, they're all, unbelievable it's just so great the way he i could go on for hours and hours and hours <laughs> analyzing the way he played but obviously that's not over here um yeah like the interesting stuff is definitely the way he got set up and then how that followed through to his move to san francisco and um you know and i guess that brings us pretty close to the end of his life um mm. where uh gosh it well, was somewhere around i think 94 95 uh, a couple of years before he died he started using a double bass drum set and um, he's, there's some great photos of him around using that. And he really wanted to get into like playing metal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> cool. now I heard, I've heard uh, stories from people who actually were, he had a trio play at Birdland in New York only, only weeks before he died. And it was Mulgrew Miller on the piano and, and Ron Carter on the bass. And he had the double bass drum set up there and they they said like i've heard this independently from other people from different people he played altogether too loud it was actually too loud way too loud for what it was it was like like deafeningly loud <laughs> <laughs> we've all uh, been in that situation where you're like oh yeah dude <laughs> yeah just chill a little bit yeah. so i mean i i would have loved to have heard that but of course yeah. you know it was never to be um and then so there's a lovely trio record with mulgrew and his regular bassist ira coleman playing some trio music um and then there are two albums towards the end of his life that are really, to me, very, very important. Um, his own album, Wilderness, which I think was recorded in 96 or released in 96. And he had an all-star band, Michael Brecker, Pat Metheny, Stanley Clark, and uh, gosh, I'm missing somebody. Oh, Herbie, Herbie once again. Hmm. And a chamber orchestra playing his orchestral compositions. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful. It is stunning. And he's got... Um, I wrote to the photographer from that session um, and he, years ago and he actually sent me a few photos from that session of Tony on his great big double bass drum set up. And uh, my goodness, again, just like moving from the four piece to the five piece to the however many pieces are in the big bus driver set, um, seven, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then to this, again, it's always this natural organic matriculation into this new thing. He's got it maybe one or two extra toms on this big drum set. So he's even more melodic. You can hear with the stereo spread of it where the toms are on this solo piece that he's, he's written. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And um, the way he plays drums on these orchestral pieces with the quintet there, you've never heard anyone play the drums like that. You know, it's just the most musical statement. It's almost like if his, everything that's come before has has culminated in this. And as they, you hear people say this about great people who leave us too young, it's almost like they go at the right time. It's like he did wilderness. It's almost like his soul was like, I've done what I came here to do. That's my feeling about it anyway, my own yeah. personal feeling about it. And then there's yeah. this other album, which uh, he did in collaboration with the great Bill Laswell. Um, there's a band called Arcana and, um, there were two albums. It's the second one that's most interesting. It's called Ark of the Testimony. And he's got the double bass drum set on that. And it's, it's getting close to metal 
aesthetics mm. um, and and um, the great Ferris Sanders plays saxophone on it. I have to say, uh, and you read the liner notes, Bill Laswell said, you know, Tony died before we got to finish this. Obviously, he got all his drums tracked, but they hadn't finished, you know, doing the mixes or whatever they were going to do. Um, and and so the the title of the first track is called Gone Tomorrow, which wow. almost makes me want to well up thinking about I it. Know, like yeah. It really touches me deeply. And, and you listen to when you hear it, but um, it, 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 there's something so touching about the ethereal nature of the way he plays on that with Ferris Sanders on the top, you know, sort of very much he was Coltrane's close compatriot towards the end of Coltrane's life. So there's Ferris Sanders at the end of two significant lives, mm. which is, I've never really thought about that before. <laughs> I just said it, but that's, Jeez, that's an yeah. interesting point. Um, and then wow. I think in February, um, February 1997, he had to go into hospital for, uh, they say, routine gallbladder surgery, he had his gallbladder removed. And one or two days after that operation, he was in recovery and he ended up dying of a heart attack, mm. uh, 23rd of February, so um, 1997. So he was uh, 51. Jeez. And uh, he's so young. so much. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. What a life. What a life what jam-packed a life. with... Uh, it's such a shame, too, that it was routine gallbladder surgery. It was just a surgery. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. like... Yeah. Now, and and I, you know, I'm sure... I, what what does it matter? But, like, it seems like he didn't have a lifetime of, like, drug abuse or going too far in the, you know, drinking too much mm. too often or something. You know, it seemed like yeah. he was a little more, you know... Um, Put together yeah well he didn't he didn't drink apparently um and but he did smoke these great big cigars okay um according to mike knock who's a pianist out here an old band leader of mine um, he played with tony in those early boston days too and so for a long time tony did smoke big cigars i don't know what, what yeah. imp- you know you're not supposed to inhale sure. with a cigar right i don't think so that's just <laughs> pretty can't cool be good for you <laughs> no so yeah. I don't know if that had any impact on on his health during this surgery you know um I mean, his wife yeah I was just going to say, I mean, if Keith Richards is still going and guys like that, then I don't think <laughs> Tony playing, smoking a couple cigars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and well, again, my, my, yeah, well, my take on it is it's on a, on a soul level. It just his time had come, you know, it was the time for him to check out. And that's, that's how it happened for him. And unfortunately for the rest of us, I uh, yeah. never got to meet him or hear him in person, but um, so many people did. Incredible. Wow. That's just such a good uh, full picture of his life. I mean, mm. So his legacy lives on, obviously he's still, yeah. as we've said, I mean, it's kind of cool in my opinion that, um, as you said, Max Roach, Art Blakey, Elvin Jones, Roy Haynes, these guys who were his idols. I mean, without a doubt, he is up there with them. I mean, he is, oh, yeah. there's no like, you know, the kid who's, you know, they kind of lump him in there. I mean, he is one of the top dog legends of, of drumming. So he, he, he achieved his, his goal there. Yeah, that's arguably true. Yeah. 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 Man. All right. Well, Dave, this was just like, I feel like I've learned so much more about Tony because I've seen tons of videos about him and all this stuff. And um, yeah. And honestly, I think you covered a lot of the great stuff. We we talked back and forth a lot about how, you know, this could be a two hour. You I mean, you said like, you, mm. realistically, you could talk for 10 hours about each individual topic. But I think this was a great, you know, uh, compact version of it. And um <laughs> For everyone listening, um, Dave has been kind enough to join me after this is recorded to hop over and we're going to do a quick, um, you know, 10, 15 minute Patreon bonus episode where we're going to learn about Dave's um, journey and how he learned all this and how he wrote his thesis on Tony Williams and what that all entailed and maybe how the reception was, how people liked it, obviously. Um, So... Yeah, on that note, Dave, where can people find you? Why don't you tell them uh, here where they can find you, what's going on with you, and you're, because you're a great drummer, obviously, um, in, in, in your own right. So, yeah, what's your, your info? Oh, thanks, Bart. Well, um, my central point of contact will always be davegoodman.com.au on the internet. And if you go slash PhD um, after that URL, you'll find the page where you can actually go to the University of Sydney electronic library and download a copy of this thesis for free you know um 
and and or everything else you if you want to know anything more about me you can all find all my socials and all that from there because they come and go don't they so we never sure. know but that website will be here forever um and i'm contactable through there of course um there's an email page so yeah cool yeah all right well dave this has been uh, a pleasure it's been uh again you're a day ahead of me i love doing the stuff with Aust- australians because it's just <laughs> so funny how like the the, the time distance and um, yeah. the time difference. And I'm, I'm so glad we could do it at a reasonable time. It's, it's nine o'clock for me and it's about what? One, one o'clock for yep, you. That's right. Yeah. It's worked out well the next day <laughs> yeah. so, in the coming to you from the future. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Dave, well, thanks so much for sharing your incredible knowledge with us. My absolute pleasure, but real, real, real honored to be here. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.